This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm looking forward to telling you about this, the work we've been doing. Uh, as Christine said, uh, this is really a, a long time collaboration with uh, Steve Peterson and our group looking at the development of the brain's functional network architecture. And I can tell you that when we got started, when I got started working with Steve, transitioning from being a developmental neurobiologist to doing cognitive neuroscience, the, this was the, I would say, the farthest thing from our uh, thought process of what we'd be going after. I'm really interested in questions like how does the brain acquire the ability to use language to read those are the have been the drivers for my interest but uh, things happen that change your your trajectory and one of the great fun parts about doing this for a living is allowing new ideas new directions to come into your into your life and this is this is a demonstration of that for me to start out as a clinician, I'm going to start with by telling you about a patient. You heard that I'm a, a movement disorder neurologist. Uh, a major part of what I do is take care of kids with Tourette syndrome. So I've just given away the diagnosis, but I think it'll be evident pretty soon anyway. So uh, I met this boy when he was 12. This was about six years ago now. He had had a five-year history of involuntary movements and sounds, including utterances. And over the six months that preceded his coming to our clinical attention, uh, he had had a, an exacerbation of involuntary movements that were violent, self-injurious, including to, in, injurious to himself as well as to his mother. And um, the call I got was from a, a community child psychiatrist across the state who said, I, I don't know what else to do at this point. Please help. He had been seen by multiple other mental health specialist and diagnosed with the whole array of uh, AXIS-1 diagnoses associated with Tourette syndrome. And he had been, as you might imagine, on a, a whole pharmacopoeia of medications, uh, the classes listed there, and there was not consistent benefit. His family history was interesting in that his mom had a severe anxiety disorder, which she, re which she told us about. And it turns out that's a pretty common situation in the management of patients with Tourette syndrome. And father was described as having ADHD, mom told us, severe combined, but there's a, a, a more to that story in a bit. And on exam, he had many tics, including the Copra phenomenon, most famous for Tourette syndrome. Uh, he immediately pointed out to me as I walked into the room, you're effing bald, you're effing bald, you're effing bald. <laughs> And I, he didn't say effin. And, and I, I said, you know, I know that. I'm OK with it. We, we, can, we can move on from there. And um, just setting him at ease, he clearly was remorseful for the inappropriate nature of his, of his interaction. So here he is on a relatively calm day uh, that we saw him in clinic. Do you hear his sub-vocalization, my tick? The head turns are ticks. The grand, I mean, it's the low uh, quality of the image. You don't see a lot of his facial movements, but he's got a lot of little grimaces, uh, mouth movements. So his, his copolalia is not uh, exclusively for, uh, to, to make a big impact, attention grabbing. A lot of the scopolalia was subvocalization as well. He, um, that was a relatively good day for him that we saw him in clinic, but he, he gradually became uh, so concerned with his coprolalia that he adapted a towel to put into his mouth. And uh, over time, that towel 
would become drenched with his saliva. And that, coupled with his anxiety, he became increasingly unwilling to go out in public. So the, his maladaptive approach to trying to manage his own tics uh, spiraled to make him more and more clinically uh, problematic over time. He was impulsive and aggressive, not shown there, but in the room, he would hit himself or in the genitals or his mother in the genitals or try to strangle himself or his mother. He uh, had the, the profound copra phenomena, and though that's the most famous feature of Tourette's syndrome, it's present in only about 10 to 15% of patients. He was, uh, had significant morbidity from these other AXIS-1 diagnoses. And although I said that dad had, was described as having severe combined ADHD when we met him, it was clear that he was uh, more autistic than um, had been previously described to us. And I think many people in this audience know that these two diagnoses, ADHD and autism, go hand in hand. And pretty soon, we'll be allowed to say that out loud um, diagnostically. And then the thing that we learned that we didn't pick up on from, a, uh, from the neurologic uh, side of the story that our colleagues in psychiatry pointed out to us over a little bit of time is that mom was only quasi-invested in, in Mark's improvement. The issue was that uh, their marriage was failing. And, and as long as she was able to attend to his significant um, neurologic and psychiatric issues, it was uh, unnecessary for her to attend to the marriage issues. So we struggled with why there was a lack of implementation of plans and, and lack of follow through. And then this other insight came through that helped us to really understand the full system level problem in the family. And here's another issue. They lived about 250 miles from St. Louis. That's the, that's the reality for delivery of mental health care in much of the country. There's a precipitous drop off outside of urban centers. So in addition to the tumult that he was experiencing individually and that the family was experiencing, the ability to come and get care directly was, was greatly limited. And he was uh, having side effects from his medication. He, he uh, had obesity, for example, that emerged due to the neuroleptic use. But the good news part of this story is that we were able to find a therapy that, in combination with his medicines, I think, worked. And that therapy is called CBIT, Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Tics. Is that something that people in the audience are familiar with? <coughs> it's, a, it's a behavioral therapy. It's, it's basically habit reversal therapy with some additional <laughs> modulation of relaxation therapy and reward manipulation. And it works. It works as well as any. Um, neuroleptic uh, medication that has been clinically trial demonstrated in, in Tourette syndrome. The problem is that it's hard to find people who can deliver it. I'm not going to talk much more about CBIT unless people bring it up later, but I think it's a really interesting and important uh, intervention that has become available to us uh, for treating Tourette syndrome. But how does it work, and, and how do the medications work, and wh what's happening in the brain systems while the patients are uh, getting worse with Tourette syndrome, or who's going to benefit from which, which therapy? And I, I think the way to get at that is to understand more deeply what's going on in the, in the nervous system. Tourette's is a, a very common neuropsychiatric disorder with pediatric onset. You might be surprised, or you may know that it affects about 1% of children and adolescents. When I was a medical student, 20, first year medical student 27 years ago, we learned it was a 1 in 10,000 diagnosis. It's now about 1 in 100. And I don't think it's because there's a, uh, a, some sort of uh, environmental phenomenon going on. I think there's just increased recognition of who does and doesn't meet criteria. It's defined by tics, but it has this high comorbidity burden with other disorders of control. There's this now kind of old uh, Venn diagram that Joe Jankovic published in New England Journal of Medicine that has Tourette syndrome as the perfect Venn diagram overlap of tics, ADHD, OCD, and other behavioral problems. I don't believe that that's true. It's not the perfect Venn diagram overlap. But I love this figure because it made it into South Park. <laughs> And uh, you know, if you if there could be a feather in your cap as a as a scientist, you'd be getting a, something in the South Park. 
If you haven't seen the episode of South Park devoted to Tourette's syndrome, it's, it's a fascinating one that uh, the Tourette's Syndrome Association was quite worried about when they learned that the season, 2007 season, would open with an episode called Le Petit, Le Petit Tourette. It turned out to be actually a, a rather warm embrace of Tourette's Syndrome and a, a, uh, a, a strong warning against pedophilia, which I think most people could agree with. And the uh, Tourette's Syndrome Association had a press release all set to go, and when they saw the actual episode, they were okay with both points that the show made. So the, the context uh, of how the brain's functional network architecture matures, I think is a, is a way to think about what's going on with Tourette's Syndrome and other disorders of development. And so that's, that's a motivation for uh, why we do what we do here. I think a network architecture provides a context for understanding how to interpret what you're seeing with sort of classic task-based fMRI activation and deactivation, but it's also a way to, to understand typical and atypical development. But to talk about a network, you, you really have to define your terms. And there's a whole world of, of science devoted to network investigation that often uses a graph theoretical framework. So when I'm talking about a network, I'm talking about something that is made up of a collection of things, nodes, that have a well-defined pairwise relationship between them or edges. So nodes and edges comprise a network. And uh, there are theoretical approaches to thinking about networks. There's a schematic that comes from the work of, of Newman that shows a kind of clumpy looking network that has what you could call subnetworks or community structure within it. So the whole matrix is the network, and then within the network there are communities or subnetworks. In addition to defining what we need by a network, we have to talk about what level of investigation uh, we're working in. This famous slide from Pat Churchill and Terry Sadowski, now over 20 years old, uh, maybe it's the most displayed uh, slide in neuroscience, shows the, the hierarchy of levels of investigation. And you can, you can work at different levels, but if you're gonna do human imaging in the current era, the most accessible level is that likely of cortical areas and subcortical structures, so something on the order of a centimeter of resolution. So that's where I'm working. I'm not talking about circuits made up of neurons. I'm talking about a granularity at the level of a centimeter, the area or subnuclei level. So after defining terms and level of investigation, we have to talk about how we're going to find our nodes and edges. So first, let's talk about node definition, nodes of our network. And we've uh, put together a couple of articles in the last few years that go into detail of why we do what we do. This paper from uh, Annals of New York Academy of Science by Gog and Wig, and then uh, the more recent paper by Jonathan Power and Neuron goes into some detail about that. I'll just say that the, the, the approach is driven by two major uh, elements. One is to derive regions of interest from task-based fMRI, meta-analyses, and the best example of that in the first example was work by Nico Dosenbach in his thesis that was published in 2006 that looked at meta-analyses of lots of fMRI studies in the lab that had task-level control as an element. And then the other approach in combination is using resting state functional connectivity MRI, which I'll talk about more in a bit, to derive um, putative areas, so-called FC mapping, we refer to it. And that was first published by Alex Cohn in 2008, and then we've had a couple of papers in kids and adults subsequently. Okay, first, um, well, let's talk now about, we talked about nodes, let's now talk about edge definition. What do I mean by resting state functional connectivity MRI? It's probably familiar to many in this audience, but the idea is this, that if you look at the spontaneous bold signal coming from here, this, in this case, this region in the left angular gyrus, and uh, its homotopic location in the right angular gyrus. And you look over about four minutes of data here, just spontaneous bold fluctuation. What looks like noise in this very low frequency uh, spontaneous uh, activity is actually highly correlated between these two locations. 
uh, Pearson Zara is 0.79 for, for these data. These historically large amp fluctuations in volt signal were considered noise and basically discarded. And it turns out that, um, that this kind of relationship, we think, and many others think, reflects a kind of functional relatedness. So here's the first example of this that comes from the work of Bharat Biswal now almost 20 years ago that kind of got buried in the literature and then uh, about six or seven years later started to percolate up again and now there's sort of an explosion of studies uh, using this approach. So what they showed here, the seeds are in primary motor cortex showing the same kind of a correlation between left and right motor cortex. And when you seed the, one of those regions in that system, you pull out a pretty good uh, rendering of the motor cortex and its related regions. So left and right motor cortex, supplementary motor area, and S2, and thalamic regions that are associated with sensory motor cortex. That was the first demonstration. And uh, so the argument is that these sets of regions that have this uh, resting state relationship have some kind of a functional relationship. And the contention is that the correlations in spontaneous fMRI signal reflect this relationship in a kind of Hebbian sense. And I mean that metaphorically. It's not at the level of a synapse that we're showing this. This is sort of megasynaptic. So it's Hebbian in the sense that these regions likely over time have very similar uh, activity profiles and as a consequence show this correlation, like a long history at this level of quote unquote firing together. What's the level of evidence to support that contention? There's some. There's some demonstrations that with uh, learning paradigms you can change specific functional connections as a consequence. But it's, this is a, a contention nonetheless. And you could do very interesting things with this kind of signal. For example, you can see that same left angular gyrus region and pull out here the places in the brain that have a strong positive correlation with that signal. And the aficionados will recognize this as the lateral aspect of the de so-called default mode network. Now, if we move this seed just a couple centimeters anterior to the supermarginal gyrus, you get a very different profile. So nearby seeds can produce very different functional connectivity maps. That observation led us down, uh, this is one of the first uh, evidences for us that we were seeing something important in this signal. I'll tell you about other evidence in a moment. But we were able to, I'm gonna tell you later on how we take advantage of this approach to map out functional connectivity derived uh, areas. Now, many of you know that there's a couple of approaches to using functional connectivity. There's seed-based analyses, and there's independent component analysis. So here's an example of seeds from Don Zhang and Mark Rakel, this review article. You can put a seed in the posterior cingulate and pull out the default mode network. You could put a seed in the dorsal anterior cingulate and pull out a control network, for example. Now, I'm using that word network in a way that's nonspecific. It's actually what it's doing is pulling out neighbors, the seeds' neighbors. It's not showing pairwise relationships between all those nodes, as I said, is a necessary element of networks. When you do an independent component analysis, this work from Steve Smith um, and colleagues, you get basically the same set of, of uh, relationships pulled out but neither the seed nor the ICA-based approaches allow character characterization of networks in the way I've defined. ICA shows you shared spatial and temporal variance, but you, you don't have any information about what uh, nodes comprise this default mode network, for example. You can't pull them apart based on that picture. And the seed-based approach it shows you the neighbors, but doesn't show you pairwise relationships. So neither of those is really a network in the way that I've talked about it. Okay, so in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna go through the arguments for why we think that this approach allows us to uh, get a strong handle on the network organization of the brain, how it develops, 
and how it may be atypical in patient populations. So first, we're going to talk about the work that Nico Dosenbach did to, to pull out using task-based fMRI control, uh, task control regions. There's Nico. He's a child neurologist uh, about to finish his training and get back into the lab. And he, in his thesis work, asked the question, what might task control signals in the brain look like? So we do fMRI to pull out executive control regions, but what do the signals themselves look like? And so a, a pretty typical heuristic for thinking about top-down control that sits above moment-to-moment -moment processing is that there's a monolith made up of elements that can initiate, maintain, and adjust how you're doing on the, in the moment-to-moment -moment processing, a standard heuristic. And so the idea was that if that's true, we'd be able to see signals related to task set initiation, task set maintenance, and adjustment. So a Q-related signal, sustained signal across the task block, and error greater than correct trial signals. That analysis by itself merits an entire discussion, and I'll just jump to this uh, characterization that he looked at 10 different tasks, 180 different uh, adult subjects. The, you see the task condition characterized here, the differences in the stimuli, input modality, mostly visual, some auditory, output modality, mostly speech, some button pressing. And across all of those conditions, he found a set of about 40 regions that had some combination of those signal characteristics. And the color coding indicates the predominant signal characteristic for, for that region. So this dorsal anterior cingulate region, for example, was driven mostly by a sustained signal. He reduced the number of regions to 22 that, that were not related to visual cortex or motor cortex or auditory cortex, and those are plotted here on the brain. So the signal characteristic is the color coding. And then went on to just populate the scheme and say, we've got some regions that are task set initiation, task set maintenance, and adjustment, and published the paper. And it was good. It was a, it was a good paper. And we said it, it sort of validated this kind of heuristic. So what he said in that paper was a large number of regions show task control related signals. The regions show different combinations. And many of the regions are in locations that people have previously related to attention and executive processes. And something I particularly like to point out to, the, to neurology audiences is that regions for control are not limited to the prefrontal cortex. They're distributed throughout the cerebrum. And then the, the really interesting thing happened was Nico, Dosenbach, and then Damien, who is a grad student in my lab and is now an assistant professor at OHSU, asked the question whether resting state functional connectivity could tell us something about how these control regions relate to each other. And there they are. And so they took these, uh, these regions. Again, the color coding indicates the kind of signals that they predominantly demonstrated. And they used a network imaging animation tool called Sonia, developed at Stanford 25 years ago, and plotted the, uh, the regions in sort of a pseudo-anatomical space, left, right, front, back, for the sustained error and start cue signals. And then plotted, in this uh, scheme, plotted the functional connections that were above a certain threshold, and looked at it and said, I, I don't see how this gets us anything more. But it turns out that the people who, who used the Sonia uh, approach had already figured out that there are better ways to, to visualize networks. And they, there's a device inside that uh, Sonia that allows you to, to basically treat each of these connections as a spring and let the whole thing relax to its lowest energy state, treating each functional connection as if it were a spring with a spring constant put a little negative force around the entire thing and then let it all collapse to its lowest energy state. And when they did that, they recognized that it came, it fell together into these clumps that look like communities inside of a, of a network with a community structure. And it turned out that the resting state found 
clumps that predominantly were characterized by specific signal types. So the blue sustained signal regions hung out together. The green start cue or initiation regions hung out together. And these error related cerebellar regions hung out together. In other words, the resting state data found relationships that were evident from task data. And I'll tell you that that, that image, that was when Peterson and I stopped being skeptical about their wasting their time on this stuff and realized there was something informative about the resting state relationships. And that was, I mean, I remember that moment, that day in the lab when we saw it and it sort of leapt off the page and we realized we were going to go down a different path altogether. Very, very cool and memorable day. So these are communities. I pointed out the, the cerebellar regions. Here's a singular opercular set that contained mostly sustained regions and a start cue set that were mostly frontal parietal regions. And so we said, Here are, here's a community structure for task level control. We unfortunately call this one sing singular opercular. It's a bad name. We didn't have good PR people that advised us to use uh, something that was easier to pronounce. And then the frontal parietal network. And uh, published an argument for a dual network architecture for top-down control, that there's a frontal parietal system and a single opercular system, and that they would do different things, sustained maintenance, adaptive online control. And it made sense for a complex system to have multiple controlling variables. That's what complex systems are characterized by, the, um, the rule of hand, you know, something like four to seven controlling variables for complex systems, whether it's ecological, economic, or equilibrium, like what's necessary to stay upright. You have visual, vestibular, and proprioceptive input. Multiple examples of multiple controlling systems. So we had, we had published that monolithic top-down controller and then came back a couple years later and said, what we meant to say was that there is a frontal parietal and single opercular system that seem to be relatively independent from each other. So that idea led to the, the notion, well, if we have these limited set of regions and they clump together, what would the whole brain look like? Could we characterize the community organization for functional areas across the cerebrum using a comparable method? So that's where we had to have a comprehensive node definition and a comprehensive um, at graph analytic approach to, to characterizing this network architecture. And this is the work of Alex Cohn, who's now a pediatric neurology resident at Mayo Clinic, and Jonathan Power, who's about to defend his thesis and go back to the clinics. So for the node definition, we used a, a battery of fMRI meta-analyses beyond the task level control one I just described, and then we moved on to FC mapping. So there's Jonathan. He looks camera shy there, but I assure you he is not. And he, uh, as part of his thesis work, used a set of, what I'll call them localizers for different signal types or task processes. You think of localizers as, we're gonna show faces to get the, the fusiform face area. But here we're using these localizers as a way to identify voxels that are significantly and reliably activated across studies that elicit a particular signal type or task process. And here's, here's an example. We had uh, a number of studies that used button pushing, that had subjects generate verbs out loud, that require them to read words off the screen, and so on. Here's the number of studies, the number of subjects that could be brought to bear on it. And from that analysis, a lot of work went into characterizing this set of regions. The color coding indicates the meta-analysis from which the region came. And notice, there's pretty good coverage, but there are places that are kind of gapped. In the Human Connectome Project, one of our agenda items is to have a set of tasks that are overtly intended to get better coverage than like, this approach did. This informed us of how to best design the Connectome Project task set. So another way to supplement that uh, no definition is the work of Alex using FC mapping. So I showed you this, that you can get really different connection patterns depending on where you put that seed. So the idea that immediately occurred to us, another one of those moments where I really remember the, oh my, I think there's an opportunity here moment was, 
if it's the case that a seed here produces a very different map than a seed here, is there a transition point? And if we can identify a transition point, is that a boundary between a functional one area and another? And if that's the case, can we run wild with that across the cerebrum and in a data-driven way pull out functional areas? So it, what Alex did was he marched seeds from one location to the other and then used a similarity metric here as an ADA coefficient. But you, there are other kinds of ways of measuring similarity and just found the place where the transition point occurred between the, the similarity between a seed placed here versus here, here versus here, and so on, and, until that dividing line could be identified and found it right here. It turns out that of all of the places in the cerebrum where you can find a dividing line using this method, and we didn't know this at the time, it was our first, first place we looked, this is the most reliable. So we got very lucky that we dove in there. If we dove in someplace else, we might have said, good idea, bad outcome, move on. But it turned out this is a really reliable location. And then a lot of work over the last several years has led us to be able to, to build on that kind of approach using edge detection methods and computer vision algorithms developed by, by others to identify locations. There's that place I just showed you. But to identify places in the brain that are very likely to be boundaries between areas and to be centers of areas. So from that, we can pull out FC mapping ROIs, we've got our meta-analytic ROIs, and we can converge the data sets and have full brain, as full brain coverage as we could have at this moment in time, 264 non-overlapping regions. Okay, so that's, that's node definition. And next we have to talk about how we actually use that to form a network. So what do you do? Well, here's a set of regions, just for schematic purposes. And then we make a correlation matrix of every one of these regions with every other region. And for each subject, average, threshold, and display. And you can, you can demonstrate for this particular network that if you threshold at zero, it gives a very dense set of connections. And as you move that threshold out, you get sparser and sparser networks still. Classic thresholding issue. So it begs the question, where do you threshold? So let's pull back a little bit to a more completely connected network, and then you can see within it clumpiness characteristic of small world networks that have community organization. And the argument is that these sub-networks or communities or modules, lots of synonyms, are evidence of a structure, functionally a significant structure within the overall network. And you can pull them out with community detection algorithms. There's a whole world of math that people use to identify communities and networks. Modularity optimization, we use InfoMap, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them out there. We use InfoMap because people who know more about this stuff than, than we do argue that it's the most reliable way of doing community detection. Um, and it's basically a it's basically a uh, information theory driven kind of method where you have a random walker moving through the network space and you use dwell time to figure out wh where the boundaries between communities likely exist. So by applying InfoMap to the thresholded network, you can attribute community uh, uh, assignment to the different nodes. And a typical way of displaying that is shown here where we have color coding the different communities at a given threshold. We look across many thresholds. That's a standard approach in this emerging discipline to see what sort of a consensus is across uh, from low to uh, higher thresholds. And you can see that there's a fair amount of jumping around in some of these communities, but some of them are kind of lock, rock solid. So there's an art to this as well. You have to look at this and say, what appears to be the uh, abiding community assignment across thresholds, frankly. But there is relative stability. And I'll show you that we've looked across cohorts and have comparable assignments across cohorts as well. So we've got a rational node definition. We have a way of, of, of uh, assigning communities through InfoMap that allows us to, to code through colors, the different communities that these nodes belong to. 
And for example, the yellow shown here, that's the frontal parietal network. Um, and now the sort of purplish color, that's our old singular opercular network. The black is the salience network that Bill Seeley and colleagues at San Francisco have described that we see reliably in our data as well. And red is the default mode network as some examples. And as I mentioned, when we look across cohorts, here's just two cohorts, but we've done out now to five samples of 40 adult subjects. Uh, and we look across those cohorts, it's, it's highly reliable. I mean, there's some noise in there, admittedly, but it's, it's really reliable across cohorts. I've been pointing out using nodes as our starting point, but you can also use a voxel approach. And the maps look very similar. And this is work, again, from Jonathan Power's uh, 2011 paper. Uh, these are so two different ways of, of rendering the, the community relationships, modified voxel-wise version and node-based, very similar results. So how well did we do using these rational nodes? Were they really rational? So the idea here is if we did a good job, what came out as a community that looked like a default mode network would look like what we see with task-based data as our sort of gold standard for identifying the default mode network. So here it is, if you see the lateral aspect, the neighbors that you find are precuneus, posterior cingulate, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, lateral temporal lobe, this, the superior frontal stuff. That's the default mode network. And so the prediction is we would see something similar in our uh, community assignment. So how did we do? Qualitatively looks pretty good. So here's the community assignment. And here's the left hemisphere for the default mode network from task-based data. We see a recognizable and somewhat extended singular opercular network shown here now in black. We see a, a recognizable and extended frontal parietal network shown here. And we see the dorsal attention system. This is from Mauricio Corbetta and Gordon Schulman's work from 2002. We see a very recognizable version of the dorsal attention system ventral attention system, et cetera. It's, it, the reliability looked really good. It was, it, I think it was a strong demonstration that the method has uh, plausibility for pulling out communities that are representative of what we see with task-based data. OK. So now what I want to do is shift to some developmental work. And this, again, is the work of Nico. The idea is that we're going to use network architecture to understand how the changes occur across development by implementation of an approach to making predictions of individual brain maturity across development. The driving force for this work is the complaint that a bunch of you have heard me say today and yesterday that group level analysis serves us well in many regards but it doesn't allow us to get to the nitty gritty of what makes uh, uh, individual, um, make us understand how individuals get assigned to different groups diagnostically, make predictions about individuals, understand how they might respond to therapy, and so on. We need a science that gets us to individual level analysis. So while group level clinical trials and group level fMRI studies, we, we learn from them. We want to get past that and understand something about this person right here. The example I, I gave multiple times the last couple of days is if I'm seeing a patient with Tourette syndrome, maybe the boy I saw in a clinic and I, that I showed you at the front end of this talk, how am I supposed to use an evidence-based approach to therapy if he would never be uh, allowed to be in any of the clinical trials that have been that have looked at treatment for Tourette syndrome. He has too many comorbidities. He would never be uh, enrolled in any study. So how can I know whether a clinical trial that's been done on Tourette syndrome pharmacotherapy is really evidence basis for him? So my argument is we need a science that gets us to the individual level more robustly. So how what's a way to do it? Well, the argument here is that we could use a multivariate pattern analysis approach. So what do I mean by that? Let me show you an example of a, this is made up to data, okay? So this is a functional connection, number one, that shows a reliable difference between children and adults where the kids have a lower correlation than do the adults. Reliable difference, single connection, but you couldn't use this as a way to, 
say whether somebody is a child or an adult based on their connectivity strength, you can't find a place that's a nice, reliable dividing point, right? Well, let's say we have a second functional connection. Number two here, also reliably different. But here, the kids have a stronger connection than do the adults. So again, we have the same situation. You can't draw a line that says, here's a reliable location for just deciding who's a kid and who's an adult. But if you plot connection one versus connection two for each individual, something magical, again, it's magical because it's made up data, but it's magical happens, you get a perfect separation between the two groups that you wouldn't recognize by just looking at one connection or the other. And this plane between these, these two connections in this now bivariate pattern analysis can be characterized in multiple ways. So how do you best characterize it? So there's a math approach to this as well called support vector machine or, or uh, machine learning algorithms uh, can address this. Here's an example of uh, a support vector machine approach. The maximum margin would define the distance between the, um, the nearest exemplars of each group, so here and here. And you can, uh, you can describe the, the individuals who sit on the margin as the support vectors for the support vector machine. And what you've done here is build a classifier. So the question is whether the classifier works for the next individual who comes along. So a method that's used often in this sort of approach is uh, a cross-validation where you classify on all but one subject, so leave one out cross-validation, and then iteratively uh, do uh, folds of the same kind of classifier and test set to, to get at a, a, uh, an accuracy of the classifier. So here we have a test set that was not seen by the classifier as it was created, and we know that it was a child, and we can ask, well, how well did the classifier do based on its uh, relationship between connection one and two? How accurate was it? We can check the label because we know what the actual result is. So what we did was we took found data from across our lab and a bunch of other labs at WashU, compiled as much data as we could for the purpose of this approach. We used about five minutes of resting state data for each individual matched individuals on brain size and head movement. And then uh, at the time, we only had 160 regions of interest, not the full set that I showed you before. And here they are. So somewhere upwards of 12,000 functional connections. And we used a data reduction step to go down to 200 functional connections total for the support vector machine analysis. We basically fed the computer matrix after matrix and said child, adult, adult, child, and let it learn in this multivariate sense, the correlation relationships for child and adult. Had data for th three sets. Data set one, I'm going to show you, 61 kids and adults, and returned a, an accuracy of 91%, highly reliable as a classifier. So then when we started talking about this result, the, the kind of snarky response we got from people was, you were only 91% accurate in determining whether somebody was a child or an adult. Why didn't you just look at them, right? So uh, that's, that's the whole idea of proof of principle. We knew the diagnostic outcome, child, adult. You might wonder, who were these adults that were misclassified as children? Um, and, and so as a consequence of proof of principle, this allows us to go to a scenario where we don't know the outcome and can, can build a machine to help us make a, a diagnosis on an individual. We're also pediatricians. We spend a lot of time looking at, at growth curves. Here's a BMI curve for girls ages 2 to 20 years. I like pointing out how the amount of space above the 50 percentile is skewed uh, for boys as well. That's, that's, another, that's a talk for another day. But the idea is that you can use such a curve, and when somebody falls off the curb, you can say, um, depending on the trajectory, what's going on here? What's, what's happening that is forcing them off the curve? The idea was, could we do something similar with our uh, functional connectivity prediction? Can we predict where somebody was on a maturation curve? So SVM can be extended to regression. You could estimate a regression in n-dimensional space. 
and it generates real valued outputs. So again, we had three data sets. I'm going to show you data from just one, but the other two replicated substantially. We could train the SVR to predict brain maturity using chronological age as a proxy. And here's the maturation curve that was returned. So there's a couple of growth curves that can, uh, that fit the data uh, equally well using Keiki information criteria to determine which of a, a myriad of, of fits were the best. And then um, the ex variance explained here was about 55% with a highly reliable return. Now, obviously, we, we don't have enough data in here. We wish we went down younger. But again, proof of principle that we were able to make a maturation prediction on a single subject using about five minutes of resting state data. Because SVM and SVR allow us to interrogate the machine to find out what features were used to make predictions, we could look at the functional connections that drove the prediction. And in orange are connections that increased with maturity and negative, uh, I mean, uh, the green were the ones that decreased with maturity, and here they are. And because we know their community assignments, this is a, a earlier version of our community uh, uh, assignments, we can say something about which communities seem to, to be most responsible for, in this multivariate sense, for uh, allowing prediction to happen. And in, in this case, it looks like the singular opercular network was a driver. Now, since that time, that was 2010, we published that paper. My former student, Damien Fair, moved to OHSU and, and, and uh, led a group of uh, ADHD investigators through the ADHD 200 consortium. Uh, that was actually 455 subjects from six centers of typically developing subjects, Brown, NYU, you can read the rest. Different scanners, different parameters, dealt with the movement artifact issue that had emerged in the meantime, and returned across uh, the, all of these different uh, sources of data a maturation curve that looked pretty similar to the one that we had described using um, the data from just our own center with an R squared of about uh, explaining 43% of the variance. Now that's with FCMRI data. A comparable approach has been implemented by Tim Brown, who turns out to did his graduate work with us years ago, was now at UC San Diego working with Anders Dale and Terry Jernigan using the PING data set, 885 individuals ages 3 to 21, and using a comparable kind of approach using different structural imaging methods, built a maturation curve predicting individual level maturation on structural data that um, explained something like 92% of the variance, so kicked our butts. And, um, and it's just structural data. And when they looked at, when they interrogated their uh, model, they found that over time different features contributed to different amounts to the ability to make predictions. So it's quite, and there are others have replicated both the structural and the functional connectivity approach. It's likely that merging the two kinds of data will produce an even more robust uh, prediction. So how does this play into Tourette syndrome? So this is work of Jess Church, who's now an assistant professor at UT Austin, and Binyam Nardos, who's a graduate student in the lab. They took uh, data from 41 mild to moderate Tourette's patients and 41 age match controls and built an SVM that had 76% accuracy, highly reliable. And the regions uh, that, the features that contributed most to the prediction came from task control, somatomotor, and default mode communities. So a reasonable degree of accuracy. It's not strong enough as a diagnostic test per se, but it's, it's a demonstration that the information is in there. In, in the ADHD 200 study that I, just, I told you about, Damien's work that published, no longer in press, they demonstrated 71% uh, accuracy for determining ADHD combined type versus typicals, ADHD inattentive type versus typicals, 83%, and combined versus inattentive, 68% accuracy. And the um, color coding indicates the, the communities that were most responsible for that kind of prediction. So another example of information in there that can be used at a single subject level to make a diagnosis. Now a limiting factor for this kind of approach 
particularly for the ADHD, is the nosological limitations of ADHD. So uh, it may be the case that despite excellent phenotyping done by all the groups that contributed data, it may be the case that these distinctions, combined type inattentive and uh, hyperactive, are not completely true or maybe change over time. Uh, there's some evidence that people regress to the mean in terms of their diagnostic uh, uh, categorization. So improvements in nosology will, I think, help. But it's also possible this kind of approach can help us to understand how to improve nosology. So overall, I've, I've told you that a strategy using rational no definition and graph theory-based analysis identifies multiple functional systems consistent with that, ex that we expect based on task fMRI and that comprise the brain's functional network architecture. We have a nice description of that architecture. I've showed you that we can make prediction of individual brain maturity using these approaches and argue that there's potential applications to investigation of clinical populations, diagnostics, and prognosis. And that specifically these methods applied to adolescents with Tourette's suggest some atypical organization of task control systems and the capacity to identify these patients using SVM. So I'd like to thank Steve, longtime collaborator and partner in this. I've po pointed out the work of multiple people, but there's a whole bunch of other people who've contributed to this work and multiple sources of funding, and thanks for your attention. I think that President Obama was getting spending some money for brain mapping, but it was for to about degenerative brain diseases. Are you getting that funding, or I don't think anybody yet knows who is getting the president's uh, the, the funding that the president has indicated will be uh, heading towards this overall initiative. My understanding is that the details of how that program will what what the program is and how it will be implemented. Uh, is yet to be worked out. We're all excited to learn what, what it will be and optimistic that some of it will come our way. Yeah. So um, just uh, for those of us who are not that familiar with this technology, can you make a comment about how functional connectivity maps onto real connectivity in, in the brain and, and uh, you know, where are there similarities and where there are differences and why that might be? Yeah, by real, I, I suppose you're talking about structural connectivity, yeah. <laughs> So um, there's, uh, it's likely constrained, but it's, I mean, it is constrained by uh, the, the anatomical pathways, but there's lots of uh, nice examples where there's discrepancy between where you see robust functional connectivity and the absence of a clear direct connection and, um, and probably examples of the opposite. So let me tell you about two of those. One is that if you place a seed in, um, in sort of uh, eccentric foveal representation in, V2, in V1, sort of near the V1, V2 border, you get a very strong homotopic functional connection. But as you know, and uh, many of you probably know, in primates, humans and, and non-human primates, uh, there isn't a strong colossal connection uh, connecting those two places. So that's a really nice example of a discrepancy. Uh, another good example is the posterior elements of the default mode network. So the medial precuneus, I'm imagining that you can see into my head, and the lateral aspect of the parietal lobe, these, these two regions have a strong functional connection, and yet uh, DTI studies do not show any strong, robust connection between those two. Another, another example of uh, a discrepancy is that one of the strongest functional connections that we see is between the anterior and posterior medial elements of the default mode network between ventromedial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate. Um, highly reliable, easy to find, one of the most robust, re reliable findings in the functional connectivity world. And yet if you go into deep sleep, that front to back relationship seems to be interrupted. And I don't think the cingulate bundle has a comparable interruption. So it, it looks like state modulates these relationships. Um, it, people want, my, uh, I, not that I want this, but others want this to be like putting HRP in. And I, I think it's not that. I think it's, it's showing a statistical relationship, but not necessarily one that is demonstrating flow of information.
So I, I, I think it is going to be constrained by the structural anatomy, but it's not necessarily going to be a, a isomorphic re-representation of it. Yeah. So uh, the mapping is somewhat task-driven. And, and you alluded to having a, a new, uh, a larger set of tasks. But developmentally, then, is that a limitation for the functional analysis? It would, I mean, most of the tasks look like they were things that six and seven year olds could do, but probably not three and four year olds. And, and how do you deal with that issue? I think that's a, a fundamental point. So the meta analyses were all driven by <coughs> adult data and. I didn't, haven't talked about this at all, but a substantial part of what I do scientifically in task world is show age-related and performance-related developmental effects for language types of tasks. So the functional neuroanatomy to successfully perform a task in an in a eight-year-old doesn't necessarily look identical to that of an adult. And it would be great if we had task-based data for meta-analyses across lots of tasks in our, our kids. And we, we, are, we have zero in our own lab of less than six, six years of age. Now others are starting to collect such task data. Deanna Barch and Joan Luby, my kids have participated in these studies. Um, are, they're doing face, uh, press a button when you see a face type task. So they're starting to uh, get some nice task, nice highly reliable task based data in these younger kids. So a real caveat is that the nodes that we've defined are driven by adult data. And we just, we yearn for the time when we have enough task data to, to solve that on the developmental and aging lifespan, basically, side. Um, thanks, yeah, this, I'm, I find this work very exciting and, and fascinating, and you I have a question about the kind of the readout characteristics. So one thing that you guys have shown, which is very impressive, is this possibility to, to essentially put someone in a diagnostic category. And then you've also shown these kind of growth curve sorts of things where people fall off the growth curves. What, assuming that you can get good enough, high enough quality data, how strong is the, because of the community structure that you have, how strong is the possibility that you can read out sort of backwards a different way, which is to find people who have fallen off the curve and ask, do they actually have a different network that's driving them off that curve? Are they off the curve because the nature of their network is actually characteristically different? To do that, which would be a compelling thing to be able to do, would require a much more reliable single subject characterization of uh, the network architecture. A lot of what I showed you was from found data, data that were collected not for the purpose of the analysis that I, I showed you that was, was sort of um, salvaging, mining, if you will. But the Connectome project, that. It's addressing your question. It's, it's, it's allowing us to collect sufficient data on a single subject level to really, uh, with as minimal noise as possible, describe yours and mine and, and David's you know, connectional anatomy, functional and structural, to allow us to make that, uh, that connection between um, an individual's idiosyncratic uh, architecture and, and how it has implications for why they are departing from a typical curve. That has to happen for the kids too. So now when we collect pediatric data, we're collecting much more resting state than we did you know, in the previous era. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, remorse for what you could have done had you known in prospect. Um, but I think just with, with the found data, we have enough of a, of a uh, a level of evidence that it motivates this more robust collection moving forward. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.